like to go to the next session uh, where uh, the activities of uh, 16G will be presented by various uh, working group leaders, as you see here. I would like to uh, start uh, with uh, the first uh, speaker. It's uh, Srisakul Tarkolsi. He, he is, uh, uh, he has a master's degree in electrical engineering at, at the Technical University of Karlsruhe. And he joined uh, Doc, Docomo as a researcher, as a researcher. and uh, he has been contributing and coordinating several internal and external R&D projects. And uh, he has been uh, actively involved in cutting edge technologies for uh, 4G and now 5G, uh, representing Docomo in several organizations and standardization bodies, including the NGMN Alliance, IETF, and TGPP. Uh, I will introduce the next, uh, the, the rest of the speakers as soon as they take the floor. Uh, I give the floor to Srisakul and uh, Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And sorry for taking some second for making the right no for problem. this presentation. Okay, so the, for today, I would like just to give you some of the uh, insight uh, briefly what we are doing in 160 years in one in the working group one where we are targeting at the use case KPI and fisher market and business scenarios. Uh, as Professor Nancy already uh, mentioned in the beginning this morning, so this work group, working group has been uh, kick off as, uh, from the middle of the year from July. So the, we are we are quite a new uh, working group here, but uh, we are trying to catching up. So, the, but before we, uh, if, uh, but for that, then let me give you some introductions on uh, what the working group one is trying to do or what it want to do. So the work scope of the working group one here is basically to develop the use case and the stakeholder perspective uh, for each of the use case, also the KPN requirement for the 60. Uh, and also we try to uh, uh, describe the scenarios, um, taking into account what you could do, different body code segments. And uh, in particular to um, keep in mind those the sustainable aspect, uh, uh, also the, the SDG from the, from the UN and so on. That's just that that's many of us has been heard for today already. We will, we will also try to the, align the language and the terminology that we're using within the 160 that is a one of the working group one work scope and we will also try to identify the level level one uh, SDO where we can uh, communicate with once the, we are done with the use case and the requirements also we try to do some analysis of those uh, input as well from the members that we uh, that we got received uh, also the uh, since the 160 year also have other working group as well, as you know from Professor Nancy this morning, we will also try to work together and collect the use case that are developing in the other working group, which is the working group two on the technology enablers. And we will also do the providing more methodologies of those the use case description in, in an efficient and flexible ways. Um, yeah, so then uh, we, at the end, we will also try to see you similar the way that we normally do what is possible and not possible for those use cases uh, from the 5G perspective. Uh, what we expected from the working group one output is basically the, uh, the position papers and also some technical white paper and reports and some of the requirements specifications of those uh, technology uh, use cases that are relevant to the 6G or some of the use cases that has that cannot be solved yet by 5Gs or some of the new use case from the new from the verticals that has not been taken into account in, in the 5Gs. We will also look, uh, try to get some output on the um, strategic and technical contributions to the standard uh, wider liaison, for example, and try to uh, talk with those the STO uh, that are relevant, in particular 3GPP and, and other things. Okay. Good. Then uh, for the other relationship with the other working group within 160, we will try from the working group one point of view, try to motivate all the partners uh, to uh, fr from the uh, to, to to contribute uh, from the from from the different vertical sectors and uh, try to invite them into to get them on board and get their requirements. 
And uh, for with the other working group, we will also try to get the, the bidirectional exchange of the information for the, for the requirements use case as well. The terminology I already mentioned here. And uh, working group three is basically the, the, the working group that are doing the uh, uh, kind of a promoting. So we are going to align and working with them to share with the other uh, working group to, to publish the paper and so on. Uh, for the outside, uh, once we come up with the, or we have the, some material available on the use case and the, and the requirements, and we will try to talk and communicate with the others. And uh, we will try to care, keep the, have an interface with them and to get the, the, those uh, input that we have uh, to the, make them aware about it. So that is the relationship from the working group one to the outside. Uh, currently, what we have today is uh, that we have um, uh, still not that many because we're still quite young, young organized association. So the, in the working group one, work item 101, we are still having at the moment uh, uh, um, more than 10, 14 members uh, on, on the board. Um, there are more of the, the, uh, some, some of them are in telecommunications sectors, some, uh, some of them are university, but we try to get more um, uh, more partner to be involved into this, in particular on the on 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 the on the vertical sector partners. So we're trying to get them on board. Uh, current the work focus of the working group one. So the we will at the, at the moment we only have one work item to talk for so far, where we try to develop the one sixty use case requirement, and uh, we have we have a target for the white paper on this, and we try to finalize this uh, by the end of April next year. And uh, we are also developing the questionnaire um, for collecting the vertical sector requirements away. Uh, we have done it, uh, but we are now trying to, uh, uh, st uh, trying to start performing the survey within this quarter. And uh, the other one that we are focusing here is that we also contribute to the working group three on the 160 position paper that Professor Nancy mentioned in the morning that it has been published today. So the, we have contributed to the use to the chapter of use case and the KPI requirement for that position papers. Um, before I close, um, but then uh, I want to go a little bit more on the uh, questionnaires. So uh, I, I will not go into details, but uh, I would, since we have quite a lot of audience into this um, event, uh, what I want, want, want to uh, uh, ask you for your intention is that we, as mentioned, I mentioned before, we have the survey on, on our available. The scope of the, of the survey is basically to collecting the vertical sector requirements. Um, and also uh, just for your information, there will be no personal data collected. Also the server will be anonymous, no tracking on the client side. And it will just take five to ten, uh, seven minutes to finish the surveys. So there are uh, some questions that we uh, want to get the, uh, the, the information uh, related to the requirements for, for the communication, for, for the official communication like 60 and so on. So if you are interested, Then basically the, we have the link now available online. So you can see the link now on the screen. And in order to access the survey, you would need to type in the password that is now shown on the screen. And uh, we will try to collect the vertical segment requirements also the, uh, for, 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 for any of you. If you're interested in please the join and try to input some surveys, I would, I would be very much appreciated. And also all the, all the people from 160 as well. Um, okay, then the, by the end of this uh, presentation that I have, so that I would like to uh, highlight that uh, without, as we, as we all know about the, the, from the beginning of today's, we're collecting the requirement of the vertical from the, from, from the, from the different sectors that would not be uh, possible if we don't have uh, all of your participations uh, and try to get uh, information from all of you so that we can develop this, uh, the framework for the, for the 6G use case and requirements. So in case the, that you're interested to, 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 to join, please contact the 160 secretary with the email address that's shown here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, thank you, Sisakun. Let's go to this next speaker. It's Arthur Hecker.
Arthur uh, has received his uh, MSc degree from Universiteit Karlsruhe and the PhD degree from AMS in Paris. And he's currently director of networking research with Advanced Wireless Technology, uh, Te Technology Laboratory in Huawei Munich Research Center. And uh, he has a wide experience uh, in uh, the telecommunications, uh, working as associate professor in Telecom Paris Tech and uh, through academic and industrial experience in network systems and system security uh, in, several, <clears throat> in several positions. Uh, Arthur, welcome. Uh, Thanks, Nancy. Can I you hear me? I give you the floor. Yes, I can hear you. I can see your uh, slides as well. Perfect, then let's go. So thanks very much for the introduction. Uh, good evening to everybody. Very happy to be here on behalf of WG2, which I'm not the leader of. The leader is Doran Despotovic, and we actually have two slots for presentations here. Um, slightly differently from the first uh, working group, we decided to go on the technical topics. So there will be more system architecture considerations in my talk, and then later on uh, more radio considerations uh, from my colleague. <clears throat> Okay, so let's go on for the system architecture part. So what is wrong with 5G? So let me also look in the rear mirror, like I've done several of the colleagues before. Um, from our perspective, uh, 5G is unfortunately still a pure access network. So there's, there's not much of, uh, uh, let's say, change from the system perspective uh, compared to previous generations. So of course there is a telco cloud, but the telco cloud is not the user cloud. So this is a problem because users cannot simply deploy uh, let's say, the uh, compute content within the network. And the 5G philosophy, let's say, in terms of design, is still somehow marked through this notion of M and O, right? So I call it three musketeers. It means, uh, you know, O for Bell and Bell for all. Uh, somehow you need to go through the operator, and uh, the whole philosophy in the design is very operator-centric still. Uh, which is, of course, fine if, uh, if uh, you know, we were not promising that much flexibility to everybody, because this is then a small contradiction. So we have been talking about slicing for a long time, but the slicing is, for me, like a new IMS, because it looks like the operator will provide the right service for everybody, and uh, the operator does not necessarily have the very same economic realities, right? So economically speaking, it's an externality. And uh, we know how it did not happen in AMS, so I, I also kind of have problems seeing how it would happen in slicing uh, now this time. Uh, point is, if you look at this a little bit, maybe sarcastically, you know, you can have 10 devices today as opposed to one device. So with 5G, this part somehow improved, or maybe it's already improved with 4G. But uh, in principle, I still, you know, have a hard time downloading a file from one to another. I don't know if you tried doing this, you might say it has nothing to do with 5G. Yeah, well, it, it's also part of the problem because it's not defined this way, right? Then uh, we have the operators who actually have a lucrative business, but now suddenly have to engage with thousands of uh, new industries to make them all happy. We see the emergence of, uh, you know, new kind of substandard organizations. Uh, 5G uh, AA is one example, very prominent, doing perfect work. Still, you know, it's not being done directly in 3GPPs, and you have 5G Asia, another very good example, 5G Health Association, which now called uh, 6G Health Association. Still, you know, why is it not being done in 3GPP? Why are verticals not going there? Is it underachieving somehow? So also, you know, from the other perspective, verticals can, of course, buy 5G devices today. Uh, so we have this kind of new elephant in the room, which is called uh, NPN, which is a very strange name to say private network. Um, but there is no core dedicated to any of these verticals. Actually, what you buy is still a core dedicated to an operator defined as per SA1 requirements in the SA2 of 3GPP. Now, the point is that verticals might have very different understanding of what should be core network, uh, you know, compared to a classical uh, mobile network operator. In principle, if you look at this, uh, nobody takes care of the end-to-end -end service, even though everybody claims that it's so important, right? So. Um, in the mental picture, there is a problem. Until 5G, we had essentially the sandwich picture understanding. We had a very nice separation of you know, clients and the whole IO, the input, output, sensor, et cetera, et cetera, and so on, which were all on the devices somehow. And then we had the service essentially in the internet. And the uh, 4G network, or, but also the 5G network is the same, was an aggregation for all those coming from you know, down there 
and then to the servers up there. And of course, this is the opposite is also true. Distribution of data from the servers up there, whatever Netflix video, cat videos from YouTube or whatever it is. And then down there through this, you know, distribution network then uh, to the devices. So you can see in this sandwich, a very strict separation of, uh, let's say compute and connectivity, right? The compute would be the bread part at the top and at the bottom. And the connectivity would be the need somehow in the middle. A nice aggregation tree, uh, it's, uh, there are many engineering problems. I will not say it's easy, but the point is we have it. It's mostly solved. And the new reality, the emerging reality and the new reality already looks like the different. So of course we still have our you know, favorite network provider, the MNO, which now very often also has some telco cloud. So actually he can, uh, or this entity can host some services. Now, in addition, we might have another network provider right because they do not exist uh, alone obviously we have several per country and now comes this npn which can come sideways and the point is even though not all of this is already standardized but the trend clearly goes into you know interconnecting these things where the terminals which are normally connected to one now suddenly can be also connected to the other and by the way if you look at this triangle representing now somehow compute service you can essentially have compute payloads of one operator deployed in the network of the other, in the domain, in the authority domain of the other. So typically, if you're a cloud network provider, you could be hosting some of the functions of the uh, NPN, uh, right? This is, uh, this is essentially a mode very, very sought for. And uh, the same can be happening in the cooperation of different providers. So now the new network reality is essentially all this. Not every individual network, not the blue ones, not the red ones, but all of them together. And if you now zoom in on one particular part of this and uh, look at this part from the perspective of the participating node and not from the perspective of the operator, then you suddenly end up in a very different picture, in a very different world, right? So let me zoom on it. So you essentially have a panoply of connections. It looks rather meshed than any kind of tree, right? And you have services around you, and all this essentially belongs to dependents. It's not one entity. It's not like the nice world where you can run around and just interconnect you know, from one base station to another. They all belong to the same operator. It's constantly changing the administrative domain, right? So you can see specifically in this picture, so the, you have a full service around you. It's not a cloud. It's not somewhere in the sky, very high over the internet. It's literally around you. It might be running on the, uh, on the nodes around you uh, and you can connect to this node. And why not consume this service locally, right? Because keeping this load locally would be actually a very smart move from, from the perspective of system loads. Then you have this open multi-tenancy. I call it open multi-tenancy because it's, it's not just a you know, limited known amount of, of, of tenants who essentially sit on this uh, common infrastructure. It's rather that they build up this infrastructure dynamically. Um, some of the thickest clouds, I mentioned it before, uh, nodes will come and go, right? We will have this kind of thing where essentially every participating node is at the same time a consumer of the service, but it also provides resources to the overall system. And if we tap into this, resource pool correctly, if we actually embrace this distributed nature and forget about trying to manage all this, you know, through centralistic policies and this, uh, this being the only way, I don't mind this as a solution for particular scenarios, but this being the only way I think is the fallacy. okay? The point is, if you look from the perspective of NPN, an interesting thing happened. We are talking about verticals, but in NPN, the vertical is our horizontal because we will sell base stations to a company which essentially tries to integrate everything within its own administrative domain. So it's uh, shown on this picture here um, where you can see that before you were accessing essentially through the transport network, probably over the internet or maybe some CDN from your terminal, some remote service. Well, in the case of an NPN, even as it's already defined in, uh, in 5G, the server could be essentially on another terminal, right? And therefore you are trying to essentially correctly and efficiently manage the whole value chain of the services and exchanges within your domain. And you need efficient means to integrate all this with your enterprise systems and with the enterprise applications. And that is the missing part, as also noted in the vertical session, by the way, several times. The good thing is that there is now an industrial consensus in the EU at least. So the 5J vision and societal challenges working group 
uh, which I now chair, by the way, has published a white paper recently in uh, June this year, uh, where quite interesting consensus have been reached. So I extracted the picture from uh, from the uh, from the paper. You can read it. It was also uh, in uh, Patrick's presentation before. Uh, you have it as a link here. I really invite you to read it. Uh, there is a clear understanding that the resource pool would be shared and that the actual mobile systems would run uh, as services, let's say, more like software abstractions, you can say, uh, on top of all this. Now, let me say something about the software abstractions. Software abstractions doesn't mean that they're pure overlays, right? They can be essentially rooted in the hardware. You can still use particular accelerators. All this is possible today. So please don't think about software as something in a very virtual layer without having any kind of links back. The opposite is the case. The modern way is to link back to the available resources, but dynamically, not in a fixed manner. And if I now project essentially the ongoing work in the system architecture domain to what has been published by the 5GIA and the consensual you know, effort from the EU companies, uh, we can see that essentially we have the AI as a service and distributed AI considerations in our working item 208. Uh, we have this kind of gluing and dynamic composition of uh, services and devices uh, in the uh, VI 207 and 211. The 207 rather looked at the standardization aspects, so integration of compute and storage and networking. And the VI 211 looked at the uh, operational and protocol aspects, right, but for the same matter, how to essentially integrate a resource pool and make it dynamically programmable as one, even though it's, of course, constantly moving, constantly changing, it's being used. So nothing of this is stable, but you need to get a stable representation of that. So this is just for recall what is being done. So why is it important or why is it interesting to do this? Well, first of all, this um, kind of, um, let's say paradigm change from, you know, I access a given operator to some kind of participatory network where everybody can bring in resources and essentially participate in, in the resource pool, but also of course in the service uh, consumption and provisioning. It allows you for a faster and cheaper adoption and deployment. You don't need to wait for one of the, you know, operators the big operators who then have a huge task. Also, you know, it's very challenging for them as well to deploy the new generation in uh, shortest possible times, you know? So you need a lot of investment in this. If we actually were pursuing some kind of more collaborative method on this, where all kinds of possible stakeholders would be deploying parts of the infrastructure as we go, that might have been faster and cheaper overall, because you don't need to take a huge credit for you know, a crazy amount of money to essentially be able to deploy this next generation. Then um, this relationship of services on the infrastructure must be resourced. So you know this in the internet, you constantly, even that flow now, the Zoom that we're now looking at, obviously I don't possess any kind of infrastructure. I didn't buy any slides for that. Nothing like this ever happened. And our packets have flowed now traverse thousands of different routers. None of them belongs to me or the company I work for, right? And still it works. So we need to understand that services must enforce any kind of quality or security parameters dynamically, not blindly. You cannot just assume the infrastructure will provide it. You cannot translate the service requirements to the node requirements. That would be too, too costly usually. You can do it, but it's uh, not anymore modern. Um, then essentially with the full service orientation, again, bringing down cloud to your local node context. Uh, not only is it more efficient because it keeps the data locally to the consumers, right? But it's also somehow a novel understanding of transforming the whole system to an open market platform, which I believe is a big uh, plus for the overall system. And finally, of course, to optimize all this, AI now can be offered as a service, let's say. So together with participatory networking, if you have AI, you would essentially require distributed ML implementations. So in conclusion, let me just tell you that um, I would advocate a more node centric thinking in the overall design rather than thinking about a particular entity in the network. So we can also say, you know, prosumer centric thinking or something, but node centric thinking essentially means that we have, we see any node as a potential resource, but also as a potential consumer of services, right? And, and therefore we need to abandon this obsolete infrastructure equal service thinking, as I just said. Uh, the good news is that nodes become much more capable every year. So we should really tap into this better rich resource pool with you know, much more CPU, much more memory every year. There are special accelerators there, there are special IO, 
really need to use it. And there are new standards now coming from specifically from the IETF, which actually adopt this already, which are usable today. It's already published at Athena versus Anima uh, working group. I can only recommend. So we can consider these new approaches rather than building the things, you know, a kind of step by step in mostly manual or system integration way. Then this uh, ML, yes, using ML has a lot of potential, but we need to consider ML as an integral system part, not some kind of separated thing which we use, you know, outside. We need a holistic design overall, specifically for ML, but also end to end, we already said it for 5G. And I will add something to this from resource to services as well. And this concludes essentially my talk. Thanks very much. Uh, I would attract your attention to the upcoming 5G PPP white paper on NPM. Uh, very interesting. And for those of you interested in research, there is a Schloss Dachstuhl seminar in Germany um, targeted for the end of the next year. So more, more or less in one year from here. I can only recommend if you're interested in this one, please drop me an email. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much, Artu. I would like to introduce also the next speaker, Israel Leiva Mallorca. He, come, he has received a, BS, a BSc and an MSc degree from the Instituto Politecnico Nacional in Mexico and a PhD degree from the University Politecnico of Valencia in Spain. He has been a postdoctoral researcher uh, since 2019 with the Connectivity Section Department of Electronic Systems in the Aalborg University. And uh, his research interests uh, are including the 5G and beyond uh, uh, and satellite networks uh, uh, research areas. So Israel, uh, I give you the floor. Thanks Nancy for the introduction. Yes, thank you. And I will quickly share my slides. I hope you can see them now. Yes, we can see them. Okay, that's great. Yes, I'm also happy that I'm now assistant professor here at Oldborough University not so long ago so it's quite Thank good you. i have That's to good. spend four more years here so it's quite nice we can keep collaborating and also it's a little bit sad to be the last presenter of the day because apparently some of the topics that i'm going to talk about have already been briefly described but i hope i can give some useful information for you so i'm going to describe the working working group two activities on four areas that we call technology pillars being so essential for 6G. The first one is high frequencies, next generation MIMO, integrated sensing and communications, and 6G radio access, which is the one that I'm leading here. So, of course, talking about these four technology pillars will take me a lot of time. So I'm going to <laughs> narrow down the description to how to use and exploit high frequencies to gain access to news spectrum and how to get the necessary knowledge about how the propagation occurs at this, in these frequencies. Uh, also, next generation MIMO is mostly about exploiting the spatial diversity. So uh, trying to use a flexible deployable infrastructure that is scalable to avoid coverage holes and how to manage the multiple antennas available now in the, in the infrastructure. On integrated sensing and communications is about how to gain context awareness while having an efficient use of resources in an integrated system. And finally, 6G radio access, which will be tailored towards how should we share the resources among the heterogeneous services that will coexist in 6G. Okay, so starting with high frequencies, and here I'm basically talking of mostly terahertz frequencies, um, where we have around 160 gigahertz available for communications. These frequencies uh, mostly occur above 100 gigahertz, um, so going to terahertz. And in this uh, spectrum, we already had uh, bands available for land mobile communications. Uh, from 252 to 175 previously in WRC 19, more spectrum was, uh, let's say, allocated to these land mobile communications. So we have a big chunk of spectrum that we want to utilize efficiently. The scenarios that we are talking about for terahertz communication, as has been pointed throughout the day, is achieving ultra high data rates for point to point communication, and we have a standard already for this. So we can use them for backhaul, front hole links in, in our network infrastructure, in wireless linking data centers, or for intra-device communication. So basically, in these uh, scenarios, we could achieve up to terabits per second 
rates with this available spectrum. But we can also, of course, based on the characteristics of these frequencies, use, uh, use them for sensing and also for imaging. But of course, we have several challenges that we must overcome to use this, um, these frequencies efficiently. So we have to have a full understanding and characterization of the propagation environment. That's the first challenge, because in high, um, higher frequencies, we have also a high free space path loss, and the effects of the atmosphere are increased with respect to lower frequencies. What I mean with this is that, uh, for example, humidity and other atmospheric effects will have a will lead to a mismatch from the actual attenuation to the one that we normally would expect with simplistic models. For example, in the plot in the right, we can see that uh, the terahertz band in the middle, we can see a mismatch between the free space path loss at 100 meters with respect to the total propagation loss that is observed. And at the bottom, we observe actually the attenuation normalized basically to the free space path loss at this 100 meters. So there are some peaks that we would like to understand and to be able to get complete awareness of them so we can provide some of the reliability requirements that are expected for the next generation of communication networks. Uh, the second challenge is that also small objects have a large impact. This can be beneficial for some applications, but also in the uh, propagation environment with multipath, this can be quite problematic. And I'm talking reflections and refractions in the terahertz band. Also, because of the high attenuation of terahertz frequencies, we need a proper antenna design that in the end means having highly directive antennas, which is beneficial. We need to design this, but also by increasing the gain of the antennas, we're losing a bit in other regards. For example, for device discovery, for uh, beam pointing, we have to be quite precise. And there's always a trade-off when increasing the, the gain and the direction, the directivity of the beams. And yeah, these are the three main challenges. Note that I have been talking mostly about line of sight scenarios because this is what is the, the main target here. Of course, going to non-line of sight scenarios will be quite complicated with terahertz. So that's why we need some supporting technologies and work in a different area that it's actually next generation MIMO. And at this point, we're talking about trying or doing work towards a user-centric and cell-free heterogeneous architecture that is flexible, self-configurable, and that can uh, have also self-optimization capabilities that will allow us to fully exploit the spatial resources. So basically, we are used to this pre-planned approach to densification where the operators have to deploy base stations, uh, macro, micro, whatever you want to call them. But in the end, this requires careful pre-planning. And going towards 6G, we're moving to a much more flexible approach for infrastructural deployment in which we can have uh, devices with relatively large capabilities, baseband units, remote radio heads with lower capabilities, and up to intelligent reflecting surfaces, which basically can be deployed, and then they will be able to adapt to the necessities of the environment. So we need a flexible and scalable AI and machine learning enabled radio access network for this optimization. We're also talking, since we're going to more simplistic um, network elements for towards a plug and play approach where we basically deploy the IRS and then they can be configured remotely or locally to the specific needs of the users. This also hints towards an energy and cost efficiency increase because uh, when we got for densification uh, in this manner, we also want to have the possibility of scaling the resources and, of course, some, do some dynamic on and off of the elements to utilize only the energy that is needed. We're also talking about reliability and resilience because now we have a much greater macro diversity in the environment. So we not only have point-to-point -point connections with micro diversity through multiple antennas on frequency bands, but we also have basically uh, an army of access points and network elements that can help us overcome the obstacles. We can use the network as a sensors, given that we have this um, 
more complex deployment of the infrastructure. And an important point here that we're going basically from a component to a system level view in terms of optimization and scalability of the resources. This is quite complicated. We're moving from centralized to decentralized, but also gives us great benefits because now we, if we do this right, basically, we could have mobile devices navigating through a sea of access points associated dynam dynamically, scaling their resources accordingly to provide a stable quality of service across the coverage area. Naturally, there are many challenges, like in the front hall, back hall, front hall, uh, how to implement the controller centralized versus distributed, how to do the scheduling and reference signal design and pre-coding. <laughs> yes. Okay. But of course, for this optimization, we need to have context awareness. You have to collect information from the environment and also from the objects. So for this, we need an integrated system that does both things, sensing and communication together, and is able to optimize resources for, for both of them. Initially, we think about sensing as trying to gather information about the object, position, trajectory, and of the environment, some imaging and mapping. This can be very simplistic from the presence detection of an object, of a device, up to very detailed measures as micro Doppler features. For example, this will relate to humans uh, obtaining the guest gestures and gait. It was also mentioned that when you move your hand over your phone, you tend to disrupt the signal. Then this is this kind of uh, granularity is also needed. But also for non-humans, we have rotating parts and moving parts that will benefit from a more precise sensing. And we see normally the coexistence of sensing and communications in the sense that we have both systems deployed in the same area. We could go to the point in which they can even share some frequency and time resources, but actually we're aiming for a much more and uh, tight integration of these two aspects. So, the basic question here is that how are we going to design these integrated sensing and communication systems with uh, transmitters and receivers that actually have uh, functions inside them that share the channel and their resources for an optimal uh, performance in both aspects? Uh, to answer this question, we're going to start by throwing some balls in the air and thinking that maybe we can achieve this integration uh, by integrating sensing in a communications waveform or the opposite way around, communications in a sensing waveform or actually go a completely different route and have a new waveform that support both, both functions with, of course, some level of trade-off for each of them. So we also need to think about novel schemes on how to use this sensor information to either assist the, in the communication link or for resource allocation. And basically the, the objective of this working item and this activity is that one, to investigate how to integrate the system and to give context awareness from sensor information to assist the communication and sensing at the same time. Uh, but not only we need to consider the physical characteristics of the object and of the environment, because this only gives us some uh, partial information of the scenario. We actually need to consider much more like traffic characteristics and also the requirements of all the coexisting users within the, in the network. And for this, we need a much more flexible and resource efficient support for services than we have in 5G. And here I'm talking in both ways, one for more extreme scenarios, uh, reduced latency, increased throughput than in 5G, but mainly to scaling and adapting dynamically the resources allocated to the users based on their actual requirements. And these are naturally heterogeneous. So the picture that we have here shows an idea that we have. Of course, it's quite limited because it's only 2021 and we don't know how the requirements will look like in 10 years. But up to this point, uh, we can basically profile the users based on their traffic characteristics, mobility, and also the requirements. For example, in the picture, the mobile user requires relatively high data rate, wants high coverage, wants to be energy efficient, and of course needs some latency and reliability. 
but how this compares to connected cars, AR, VR, or extreme reality and IoT devices, well, uh, of course they are not the same. And thinking that they fall into three boxes is probably too simplistic. Um, that's why we want to make this more user-centric and service-oriented. Slicing, resource allocation, and protocol selection. So for this, we need, uh, on the one hand, to relax some of the orthogonality constraints. So this means that we have resources in frequency, time, and space, and even code that we can allocate orthogonal to the users. But anyway, to be able to serve more users, probably we need to schedule them and allocate these resources non-orthogonally. This will allow for a much more efficient and flexible access. We need to design advanced and lightweight access mechanisms, which is uh, one of the goals of 5G. I have to say they have improved quite a lot in the standardization as 5G has evolved. But here we want to do this from the beginning, basically give the tools to the network for self-optimization, allowing it to select the correct access mechanism for the scenario at hand. We also need to investigate trade-offs of multi-connectivity and considering diverse interfaces that can vary in terms of bandwidth, in terms of access mechanism, and so on and so forth, that will uh, actually lead us to some trade-offs of efficiency, latency, reliability, and on any other performance measure that you can think of. And also talking about multi-connectivity, we have to do a system level optimization and resource allocation that ends up being a trade-off between per user versus overall, uh, uh, for example, throughput or latency. So basically the resources have to be shared among different parties with different requirements and characteristics. How to do this is quite complicated. Um, and yeah, another point that I want, want to stress here near the end of the, of the talk is that um, we have oftentimes talked about orthogonal, non-orthogonal sharing and slicing in terms of users that want the same type of requirements. For example, we are all used to this uh, achievable rate regions of multiple access channel. But when we have uh, a slicing of the radio access network resources among different services that want different uh, performance requirements, for example, one user may be interested in throughput, another in latency or in energy efficiency and so on and so forth. It's quite complicated to define what is capacity and what is efficiency. So we need new methods to actually measure this and to tell the network what to do using AI, machine learning, so on and so forth to be able to optimize in terms of resources and at the same time provide the required um, QoS to the different users and services. Of course, this will end up being some trade-off between throughput, latency, reliability, efficiency, and so on and so forth. So we need flexibility in diverse access modes, uplink and downlink in a cell-free MIMO architecture. And just to conclude, all of these topics are uh, the central part of four Working items 204, led by Thomas Kerner, focuses on high frequencies. 205, led by actually me, deals with radio access. 209, next generation MIMO, uh, led by Martin Schubert. And finally, integrated sensing and communications 210, led by Andrea Giorgetti. There's many more people involved, but since the association has been growing quite fast lately, I didn't want to miss anyone and just left it <laughs> with this. Few few logos. I hope it's fine and thanks for your attention. This is thank it. you, thank you, Israel, for your presentation. I think your presentation and Artus uh, also have covered some of the the questions that we have here. In any case, if you have any uh, short comment, uh, there is one question saying that I believe the issue with slicing is the latency or better the management of jitter for URLLC networks and the asynchronistic behavior of the operator's network and the requirements that you have at the real life vertical industry, like where things, uh, for example, holograms uh, of real time safety operations are required in a local campus network. Is it not so? So it's, I think the issue about the latency or the management of the jitter uh, in uh, 
such networks? Yes, so this is a quite complicated question, but also hints towards what we are used to see with orthogonal slicing. So basically, if you have a service that is URLC and your approach to slicing is give this service a given uh, number of time slots, let's say, you know, FDMA, then yes, you can have this problem. Why? Because you have your LLC, yes, you have your service and you have resources for your activation at a specific point in time. But sometimes you generate data, not exactly at those times, and then you, you will have to wait for it and then it becomes a problem. Uh, we have made some work also non-orthogonal slicing where you actually leave or let the user use some resources from, for example, throughput oriented services, it will disrupt slightly the service, lowering slightly the, the quality compared to when, to when you didn't have the user there. But in the end, it, this can lead to a much more flexible, agile use of resources, supporting more users actually than mm -hmm. what you will have in orthogonal slicing. Okay. Uh, yeah, if I if I yeah. can add to this, Nancy, of course, from the uh, core network perspective or system architecture perspective, the question cannot be limited to radio only. And if you now look at how slicing actually is defined in 3GTP and what we really have out there in you know within the specs in the standard way, uh, well, you don't have any mapping of uh, what you promise to the network resources and service resources. That simply doesn't exist. It means that uh, you know either you do it uh, more or less orthogonally, just what uh, Israel just said, but uh, now in the networking domain, you would essentially pre-provision something. Uh, okay, I can pre-provision, but then I, I run in all kinds of problems because then I need to manage the pre-provision things. And of course, whatever I pre-provision, it's, uh, you know, it's like a bus lane. I cut out part of my resources for particular service. So it's either constantly underused and therefore I am essentially you know, penalizing everybody else for no reason, or it's overused and then I'm not giving what I should be giving to those who require it. So point is, we need to go to dynamic handling of resource requests to the resource mappings, right? So we have some resource pool and we have some requests. If we start pre-shelling this, it will be always very simple and it will never work. We know this because it's a simple matter of uh, you know, all this control theory and queuing theory, we know this. You cannot pre-design a system unless you have a very strong admission control, then it becomes you know, it's starvation, more or less. So to avoid this, we need to go into dynamic assignment of resources, we need to reshare, we should not orthogonally cut anything because this is very similar to hardware slicing. That, right? So there are so many problems with slicing, don't even you know, let me get started with this. Okay, maybe one very quick last comment uh, about the last question. What do you think are the implications of the additional complexity of the network in the cost and the complexity of deployment? Seems that the requirements will mandate a vastly more complex network in the field. Yeah, in the, in the I spread think... of complexity, you can go, Arthur. Yes. No, 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 Israel, I just wanted to say the question actually came after the previous session. It's from 4.40 p.m., so it's before we started. But we can try to answer it still, of course. Yeah, sure. It, it's also a matter of where you place the complexity, right? Because we are uh, okay by saying, yes, IoT devices, they are, there are many of them deployed within the area and you, have, you need a more complex network infrastructure that can manage the access of, of these devices. But of course, we cannot think that the devices themselves can do it. So it's, it's a trade-off between where you will place this complexity, where you will place the controllers and um, Basically, if you're already having AI and ML capabilities for network optimization, then yes, this is something that comes inherent to, to the networks. It becomes slightly more complex because there are many more resources and requirements and so on and so forth to fulfill. But this is, of course, we're thinking uh, 10 years from now, so we have time to catch up. Uh, I can only compliment this because uh, what I mentioned in my slides, so this anima approaches and so on, they all essentially are about uh, mechanisms and protocols for autonomous network management, right? And uh, these things are not uh, science fiction anymore. You can literally download it and use it. You just need to inverse the, the way how you think about it. You don't think about it like, okay, I need to do some network planning. I mean, you can do it, but it's not the primary way of thinking. I have some service, I need this kind of capacity, then I need to, to do some network planning, then I deploy it, then I configure it all correctly, and then it all works exactly in the way 
predefined, right? Some kind of, I don't know, waterfall or even a V model for, you know, hardware. But uh, today it would be rather different. Uh, just think about it from the, from the perspective of nodes. You just deploy nodes, you deploy capacity. And then you kind of intelligently tap into this capacity. And by the way, the nodes auto-organize. And the auto-organization with provable properties, by the way, that was there before the AI even uh, you know, have become so popular. We don't need very complex, you know, learning mechanisms to auto-organize an aspect. Think about STP, RSTP. These things have been around as long as we talk about metrics, right? Since the 80s. We have them in all switches. Uh, think about DHCP, all this auto-configuration and uh, auto, you know, flow pre-assignment uh, ways, they exist and we use them on an everyday basis. Uh, we have the same with the routing on the internet scale, you know, it's all, all automatic. Yes, of course, there are many policies and they are, of course, you need to configure these things so that they match your policies, but the mechanism per se is distributed and autonomic. So we need to go this way. We need to essentially throw in resources. They get, uh, first of all, somehow available to whomever the owner is. The owner can then upload the policy on these resources and the resources get essentially autonomically included. It's exactly what you do with any other complex piece of hardware today. Well, thank you. Thank you all. Uh, I would like to thank all the participants and, of course, all the speakers uh, that uh, put the effort to contribute to this uh, summit. I think we had uh, quite uh, interesting sessions. Uh, we have tried to address uh, the inclusion of the engagement of the verticals. We have tried to address the trends, the research trends and uh, also uh, to get the view of uh, activities around the globe regarding 6G. I hope everybody enjoyed uh, the summit and uh, we look forward to meet all of you again in the future. Thank you all, enjoy your afternoon. Thank you, bye. -bye.